9 a.m., panel number 3, row 15, The Future of Music, Its Rock and Its Role in Society. Good morning. I'm Bill Obermeyer, Executive Director of the Dairy Arts Center here in Boulder, and I want to welcome you and thank you for joining us today. I also need to tell you that in this session, we'll be utilizing both the CWA app and a note card system to receive questions from you. So to ask a question in the app, simply select the session, this session, and then tap live Q&A and then insert your question and it'll pop up here on my phone. Or you may raise your hand at any time to request a note card and a pencil from Joe and um, he'll give those to you and he'll collect your questions and bring them up. So that's how that will work. We're gonna have uh, these fine folks talk for a little bit and we'll have some discussion up here and then obviously we'll have time for the questions and answers. Uh, I want to give you, introduce to you the panel, just a quick note about each of these panelists. Starting with, um, with Adrian here. I'm, I'm, what I want to do is I want to give you some of their own words from their social media pages. Ooh. So, oh. quoting from his Facebook page, Adrian says, I was born and then, it, then started doing stuff. I still do stuff. One day I might stop doing stuff. I thought that was a pretty good analysis of life. In Mark Andrews' review of Adrian's second recording ricochet on Adrian's website, Andrew says, who's to say at the end of his career whether Toronto's Adrian Ferrugia will be known for his skills at the piano or for his compositions? While that career ascends, you need to listen to both. So we'll Thank hear you. from Adrian here in a moment. Next, Adrian is Alison Delphium, and quoting from Alison's LinkedIn page, she says, my journey in the music industry started at the age of three when I picked up my first instrument, the piano. Ever since then, my life has been dedicated to all aspects of the industry. So here we are, already at age 20, Allison has become, in her own words, a passionate innovator, businesswoman, musician, and dreamer. And next to Allison, of course, is Ernie Watts. And quoting from Ernie's official website, Ernie says, I see music as the common bond having potential to bring all people together in peace and harmony. All things in the physical world have vibration. The music I choose to play is the energy vibration that touches a common bond in people. I believe that music is God singing through us an energy to be used for good. And finally, James Viator, and I want to quote from Vince Vance in the Valiance Facebook page. We put the rock in rock and roll and our lives are dedicated to the fun of having fun in music, dance, comedy, and audience involvement. Now I know you're thinking he's introducing the wrong guy. Actually, <laughs> actually, James put that band together back in 1971. And you see, while he's teaching law during the week, on weekends he's playing the French accordion and drums in Rattlesnake Shake, a Louisiana blues and Zydeco band. So there you know a little bit more about each of these people. So now let's begin this discussion with um, Adrian. All right. And you can talk about the topic. I will talk about the topic. <laughs> Hi, thanks for being here. Um, well, I think the future of music is uh, functionally the same. I think it's always been the same. Uh, I think its context is evolving. Um, I actually wanted to. She wanted to read something. I uh, quoting um, Professor Carl Polnick, who's the uh, director of music at Boston University, and uh, this is a note that he um, has pinned on on his office door. Um, I read this to you last night, Brad. Um, it says, to all music majors, if we were a medical school and you were here as a med student practicing appendectomies, you'd take your work very seriously because you would imagine that some night at 2 a.m. someone is going to waltz into your emergency room and you're going to have to save their life. Well, my friends, someday at 8 p.m., someone is going to walk into your concert hall and bring you a mind that is confused, a heart that is overwhelmed, and a soul that is weary. 
whether they go out whole again will depend partly on how well you do your craft. Um, I like that. Um, I like that for several reasons. As, as a musician, it, uh, it brings validation to what and why I do what I do. I, I believe um, that music has power. Um, in Ernie's introduction, uh, there was talk about vibrations, and that's something I believe very deeply in. Um, you know, I remember being in uh, science class in high school and being kind of blown away when my science teacher told me that if you break that chair down to its smallest particles, it has the same particles that I have. And the, the entire universe is frequencies and vibrations. And I mean, um, I, I look at music as a very powerful form of vibration. Um, and considering all we are is vibration, um, it, it gets me it gets me thinking. Um, who was at the the keynote address on Monday? Uh, Deva Newman. Is that how you pronounce your name? Is it Dave? Dava. Dava Newman. Um, and it was really cool, but there was one moment where um, <clears throat> she was showing this video of, of the the inner workings of of all that they're doing at NASA. And a lot of it was, you know, a large factory floor. And they were putting together various pieces of space exploration probes and, and ships. But there was this, like, sweeping orchestral John Williams-esque music playing. And it was interesting because you're watching it and it's like, it's it's dramatic and it's uplifting and it's giving you this sense of hope and what lies beyond the stars but if you were to take that music away what you'd see is a bunch of dudes with welding torches <laughs> and just kind of this sort of mundane scene from a factory but you add the music and and it, and it creates something uh, you know uh, i also remember seeing this really funny uh YouTube video, which was famous movie scenes um, with different music. And, you know, what, there was a scene where Darth Vader and Luke Skywalker are having their final showdown, and they were playing the, the theme music from, from the Benny Hill <laughs> TV series, and it was hilarious. Um, so, I mean... Yeah, so just looking at sort of that aspect of music, you know, it, it, it adds things. It, it's, it's one of the most reliable ways to elicit uh, a feeling, an emotion. Um, you know, it's a, it, it creates a sense of community. I mean, I remember uh, sometimes I'm working with really young students and I'll say, who's your favorite musician? Taylor Swift. Cool. Um, what is it you like about her? Oh. And they get this kind of look on their face like they've never really considered that. They just like it. And, and, and you know, with a little more probing, it, it turns out that it's basically they like it because their friends like it. And it's, it's a communal thing for them. They're, you know, they share this appreciation of this music because it gives them a sense of belonging to a community. Um, you know, music's been around forever. I mean, it's been a part of um, religious ceremonies and um, rituals and... Um, anyway, I, I think I'm starting to ramble on that aspect of it. Um, as far as the future of music, I mean, if you talk to the average musician in 2017, uh, I, maybe I shouldn't say that because 
I don't want to make sweeping generalizations, but you know, you hear a lot of complaints about the way the music business is going. Streaming, we're not making any money, and um, you know, obviously the model, the models changing, the 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 methods of delivery are changing. Um, in in many many areas, it seems a little more challenging to get people to get up, leave the house, sit down, and pay money. Um, to listen to music. Um, it seems to be a growing challenge to captivate an audience with just music. Um, you know, we're in a day and age where you can look at this tiny little thing and see many stimulatory wonders. Um, there's a real... Um, barraging of our senses with the way the with the way technology stimulates us and and so you know you see you have some musicians who are taking the approach of well I've got to make my show bigger I have to add more visuals I have to uh, I I have to make it a more stimulating experience to compete with the heightened levels of stimuli that the world presents in this day and age and then I think you've got other musicians. Um, I, I can speak for myself that 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 I I fall into this category, and it might be a bit presumptuous, but I, considering one of my greatest inspirations in this area is Ernie, I'm going to say that he falls into this category too. Is don't don't make the music bigger and brighter and louder. Um, make it deeper. Um, go deeper search deeper um, fine tune those vibrations so that they can penetrate all that noise um, for me it's actually going to a quieter space as a starting point for the music to come out and that's and that's where I have hope about about what music can do is no matter what um, no matter how loud and chaotic the world gets, we all have within us this this place, this 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 quiet awareness of 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 life, the universe, our connectedness, and I, and I, and I'm grateful that I can be a part of exploring. Th the musical aspect of that, because I think it's one of those universal things. It'll it will speak to anyone um, when. Now I'm speaking as a I'm speaking as a musician who creates music. So, or I don't even like to think of it as creating music. Harnesses music that's already out there vibrating in the universe. Um, you know, my, my job's to refine my ability to capture the music and bring it into this this material plane, the, the plane where it vibrates your eardrums and it vibrates your chest. Um, so, music will always be here. Um, and I'm going to keep playing it until they bury me in the ground. Um, and I think I'm going to stop there and let these other wonderful people share their thoughts. Thank you, Adrian. Now, Alison Delphia will talk about the future of music from her perspective. Hello. Um, just a little background about me. Um, I'm a current student at the University of Oregon, and um, you know, I think my perspective is being a 21-year-old and working in the music industry, um, not as really a, a professional musician, but more from the strategic side, um, I think this panel is really interesting because I think when we talk about the future of music, um, I think I kind of question what does that even really mean? Because um, we can't really totally know what the future is going to bring, and I think the perspective of what a musician thinks the future is versus a booking agent and our managers, it varies. Um, so I'm going to talk more on the level of um, what I do, which is more strategic management and artist development. And um, I kind of just want to talk a little bit about uh, streaming services. I think uh, you know, streaming music has totally changed um, the way that 
artists are making music and promoting music and how fans are listening to the music that they like. And um, it's kind of taken away the, the importance of physical copies of music. Um, this last year was a big year for the Grammys. Um, there's an artist named Chance the Rapper. Um, he's been coming up in the last few years and he made history by being the first uh, musician ever to win a Grammy by not selling physical copies of his music. And I think that's just kind of showing where the importance of music is going and um, how important streaming has become as far as making music and trying to make a living off of music. Um, and I kind of bring that up because because people aren't making much money off making music, we have to find other ways to get a profit. So um, concert tickets have significantly rised, um, at least in the Los Angeles Los Angeles area. And um, you know, it's kind of bringing on a management level new ideas of okay, well, people are spending all this money to go to concerts and see these artists that they enjoy. How can we make the experience better and bigger? kind of as he was saying. And, um, you know, I do think it's taken away from, like, the physicalness of the music. I think when you we're adding all these visuals and lasers and, you know, film is in music now, it, it's, it's being cluttered. I think that there's so much stuff in the music industry right now that we're, in my perspective, in my age group, we're moving away from what music actually is. It's not about the message anymore. It's about the money and the glitz and the glam and so I think that what I'm kind of getting at is how technology is affecting the music industry. Uh, one of the big topics right now uh, in the LA music scene is incorporating virtual reality into concert experiences. And because concert tickets have gone so high up in price, you know, not everyone can afford to go to a concert anymore. So how can we use virtual reality to bring the concert into someone's home? And that's been a topic talked about a lot, and we're, we're slowly seeing it in a lot of musicians. Um, this past year, an artist named Childish Gambino, he's kind of a hip-hop guy, um, R&B guy, and uh, he kind of came out with virtual reality for his album, and he's coming out with the first vinyl set of virtual reality, which I think is very interesting because combining vinyl, which is one of the older ways of listening to music, with virtual reality, which is the new cutting edge version of experiencing music. It's this new type of immersive ex media. Um, and I do think it's changing the way that we experience music and we value music. And I think that, you know, all these things um, of technology and 3D projections and concerts is really changing the way people my generation are valuing music. I think it's less value on the content and more value on the, the experience. And I don't know if it's a bad thing and I don't know if it's a good thing, uh, but it's definitely changing the way people like me and my job are having to deal with these things of, you know, telling musicians, well, yeah, the album's amazing, but this isn't good enough. You know, it's how, like, how can we entertain people more? And I think people my age have gotten like so spoiled and it, it's just never enough. It, like it, now every musician's coming out with a film for their album. And that's still not enough. Um, Beyonce came out with a visual album this past year called Lemonade, which is an amazing piece of work, yet it still didn't win Grammy of the Year there for album. You know, and it, like, when is it, is there ever going to be enough? And I think that's like my question for more people my age. And as music continues to evolve, especially in more of the popular music and pop genre of, you know, where where are we heading with that? And I'm very curious to see what we're doing. And it makes my job a lot more complicated as managers, we're thinking four years down the line of what, what can we do that no one else is doing right now. Um, so yeah, I think my perspective of it comes more from the technology side and I'll be curious to see, yeah. Thanks, Allison. <laughs> Ernie Watts. Uh, there is no future of music uh, it's the present. Everything is the present. Uh, the future is the present. The past is the present. It's about our perception and uh, how we think about all of these things, what we perceive, how we see ourselves within this world, within this life. Uh, 
I think what we do and uh, what happens with us is we get more concerned, like we get more concerned in the effect than the cause. Then we lose the cause. And then everything becomes effect. And that's what we are seeing in our culture. That's what we are seeing in the, this period, this chronological period of time. Everybody's very, very interested in effect. You know, we want the stuff. We always want the stuff. We got to get the stuff. But what's the stuff? You know, what are we? What makes us, what, what makes us be? And it's perception. It's concept. The stuff is what you think the stuff is. That's what the stuff is. Then, in relationship to perception, it depends on how much you buy into concepts that are sold to you for someone to benefit that this here is the stuff. You got to get this stuff because if you don't get this stuff, you're going to be behind. Behind what? Right? Does that mean you're going to be dumber? Does it mean that you're not going to be as evolved? Or does it mean that you just don't get the iPhone number 9 X2Z <laughs> first in your block, right? So now we're dealing with concepts. Um, let's deal with the title of this thingy here that we're doing. Uh, supposed to be the future of music. We already talked about that. There's no, mu there's no future because we're just here. We're here now. You know? um, and then it says it's rock and it's roll. Okay, it's roll in society. What is music's role in society? Okay, music's role in society is also perception. Music's role in society is what we think it is. To a lot of people, it's propaganda. You know, music is propaganda. You know, brush your teeth with Colgate, Colgate dental cream, it cleans your teeth, you know? That's music, right? And that's propaganda. So, we go, f we go from that to the rock, right? The, the, the rock of music is the fact that music is vibration. Music is the beginning. Uh, I believe that music was the first sound. The first sound was somebody, some guy going, uh, 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 uh. and then he goes, huh, right? And then people start going, hey, <laughs> around the fire, right? And they say, wow, this guy is really something. He should start a religion, <laughs> right? So. Then it goes on and it goes on. And so music uh, eventually, or in the beginning, or however you'd like to think about it, uh, is like Adrian was, ha had mentioned, you know, it was a part of ritual, spiritual ritual. It was used for uh, initiation in, in mystery schools, in, uh, well, Egypt first, everything came from Egypt, you know. Uh, then then uh, Greece, and then, you know, the Romans came along and they uh, commercialized all that Greek stuff. And, you know, so 
it just goes on and on that way. Uh, but the basis of the music is to touch or be a part or be an extension of the spirit, which is everything. Everything is vibrational, everything is spirit. There is one cause that nobody can explain. I always put this out whenever I, whenever I do one of, one of the uh, CWA things because it really gets people and I love that. I always say at some point that the purpose of science is to prove the existence of God. Because no matter how far you chop it down, no matter how many books you write, no matter how many new words you come up with, nobody knows. They still don't know. Stephen Hawking doesn't know. He thinks he knows, you know. That's a, it's a concept, right? We're dealing with perception again. Uh, so, therefore, there's always this X factor. Therefore, there's always an element of doubt. Therefore, we're always dealing with that way down inside of ourselves, because we are lost in our minds. We're lost in our heads. We're lost in our thoughts. We are lost in our perceptions and we don't realize that we're trying to get something that we already have and basically all we have to do is open ourselves up and receive it, which is, which is this incredible energy. Uh, it's very difficult for people to recognize that something that is that important can be that simple to tap into. So music, for me, is one of the ways we tap into universal energy. Uh, instrumental music is very important in that way because everybody gets to make up their own story, right? If you hear a tune, if you hear somebody's song, they're saying, I woke up this morning, my baby done left me, and I wish I was dead. Right? So there you got the story. Right? But if a person plays, I woke up this morning, it's really bad and I wish I was dead, somebody will hear that and say, wow, that really is cool. That sounds like the sun coming up. Or wow, that really is something. You know, it reminds me of my Uncle Dave. Right? And, the, and everybody comes up with their own story. In our society, that is incredibly important because individuality is being uh, conditioned out of our society. What we are as people is slowly being eroded out of us. So that is the importance of music. That is the importance of instrumental music. That is the future or the present or the past of music, is to touch something inside of us that is ineffable that we can recognize. And then it helps balance all the stuff. So I'm gonna stop right now because, uh, you know, this, is, this can go on forever. Uh, uh, basically, we need to open ourselves up to the spirit of what our music is. And when we do that, it opens us up to each other because we're all a part of the same energy. We're all the same guy. We're all the same person. We're all the same being. You know, we're all this infinite energy manifesting on individual levels. That's what the infinite universe is about, right? That's why the, that's why the universe is infinite, right? Because there's no, there's no beginning and there's no end. But it's all in us. So...
Thank you. Thank you, Ernie. <laughs> and next, James Viator. Well, I want to thank Ernie for relieving me of the duty of being the first bad boy in class who refused to talk about the assigned topic. <laughs> um, and also, I had already decided, uh, Ernie bucked me up, on, just on the sage advice of that great American philosopher, Yogi Berra, who said, it's really hard to make predictions, especially about the future. <laughs> so I don't know what the future of, mu of the music is, but I've, I've, I've seen the past and the present of music, so I want to talk about that. And as for its role in society, um, I was really fortunate enough to grow up in a hotbed of music, New Orleans, and come of musical age, New Orleans, 1958-59, through uh, the Meters and the Neville Brother, the Neville Brothers in the in the early 70s, and so it was real clear to us. And what I've read, it was this was also to a great extent true of most rock and roll places in that at the time. It was true of us. It was clear what the role of music was. Um, to go to dances with live music, like um, Art and Aaron Neville and the Hawkettes, who became the Neville Brothers, Deacon John and the Ivories, Irma Thomas, Sugar Boy Crawford and the Cane Cutters featuring the lovely Sugar Lumps. Um, all of these great, great dance bands. And then the high school bands, people my age, would play their songs. We'd imitate them. Um, and we all played for CYO dances, Catholic Youth Organization dances. Uh, there were boys and girls high schools, so one way we got together was at the CYO dances on Fridays and Saturday nights. So it was real clear what the role of music was. Dance with a girl. <laughs> That's what the role of music was. Um, and so music was connected to the feet. It was not head music. It was social music, first of all, and it, it was dance social music, and it was fun. Um, and you didn't talk about, there's been a change. People talk now about going to see a band. We talked about going to dances, and who's playing? But you talked about going to a dance, not to see a band. We didn't talk about concerts. And so that began to change, and, and I saw its effects firsthand. Um, I'm sure there were, there were precursors and other causal events, but it really changed with the British invasion in 1963-64. If you talk to Irma Thomas still today, Irma Thomas, great New Orleans, uh, uh, we used to call her a blues singer. Now you'd say a soul singer or rhythm and blues singer. But if you talk to Irma Thomas still today, she'll spit twigs if you mention the Rolling Stones. Because she had a local Gulf Coast regional hit with Time Is On My Side. The Rolling Stones covered it and just knocked her career for a loop. And, and that's what happened to New Orleans music and, uh, and other pieces of rock and roll with, with the British invasion. Um, still, when the Beatles and the Rolling Stones first got here um, at, at record parties, everybody carrying their 45s on their thumb to go to a king cake party, um, during Mardi Gras season, you would play the records and dance to them. So it was still dance music. Um, and we, and we, we liked those British bands. Um, Art and Aaron Neville and the Hawkettes and Deacon John and the Ivories learned their songs because they were still dance songs. And then when Rubber Soul came out, some people in here might remember that Beatles album. When Rubber Soul came out, I remember we all, in, in my band, we all went and got it and we were going to learn the latest songs and we played it and we thought, what the hell? Well, it's like got sitar music and folk music, and we can't play that at the CYO dances. And so music became, you know, as everybody said when Sgt. Pepper came out, rock and roll became art. And when it became art, it took people off the dance floor. And the same thing was happening in San Francisco with the concert scene there. Bill Graham started a, a rock and roll concert scene. And it was sort of like big indoor love-in picnics. And, but people didn't dance. They watched. It was an event. It was a be-in. And then arena rock started. And all of that led people off the dance floor. Um, 
as the music changed from social dance music um, to, and I'm talking about rock and roll, rhythm and blues, it led people off the dance floor. And for the first time, black and white music began to diverge sharply. Notice all these bands I'm naming and the ones we imitated, and you could say it nationwide. Elvis imitated Bo Diddley, we imitated Deacon John and the Ivories and Fats Domino, and then the, the loop was they would learn songs like a, uh, Deacon John and the Ivories would learn A Hard Day's Night but do it with a horn section. Otis Redding did Day Tripper with a horn section. It was all still dance music, and then when it became concert going music and art music, that is rock, the two streams diverged. It was not a biracial creolized, vibrant dance music anymore. It became two different kinds of music. Um, and I think that's still sort of where we are. Um, Beyonce, she puts on shows. She puts on Broadway shows. People don't go there to dance. They go to see. Um, it, it was that way with Grateful Dead concerts. They went there to see or to experience. They didn't go to their dance. New Orleans is still a town where every club has a dance floor. It's, it's still connected to the feet there. And there are still integrated bands, and there's still white audiences that go to black bands and black people that go to see white bands. So we're sort of the, the ant trapped in amber in New Orleans in terms of that, that biracial music. Going all the way back to Jelly Roll Morton. Jelly Roll Morton had an integrated band recording in the 20s. Um, going all the way back to then, New Orleans has been sort of unique in, in keeping musicians feeding off of each other, black and white, and learning dance crazes from each other, go, dance crazes, styles, and going to the same venues. Now that was also true in America. It's really, really interesting to rent, and I urge everybody to do this, because first of all, they're, they're good shows. Rent the Tammy Show. Does everybody remember the Tammy Show? Teenage American Musical Invitation, 1964 Santa Monica Civic Auditorium. And it played at theaters. I saw it at the, at the Westgate Drive-In in New Orleans in, in 65 with Dutch Battle. Um, and we got out of the cars and were dancing to this movie. And it was an amazing movie for all kinds of reasons. But here was who was on stage. Um, the Beach Boys, Jerry and the Pacemakers, the Rolling Stones, Smokey Robinson and the Miracles, James Brown, The Crystals, a perfectly integrated music show playing for largely white teenage audience. And if you look at the films, everybody's standing up and everybody's dancing. And we got out of cars at the drive-in theater and we're dancing. Fast forward to Woodstock, not that many years later, 69, what, four years. 33 acts, three of them, and only by very generous definition, only three bands were African American. And the Jimi Hendrix band had a white British rhythm section. So they, they barely qualified. Sly and the Family Stone, Richie Havens, Jimi Hendrix experience. That leaving the dance floor and turning into visual music, I think, separated the two musical streams that had never really been separated before. Jazz in New Orleans was a biracial music. Every jazz musician will tell you that. Papa Jack Lane, white trumpet player, had black musicians. Jelly Roll Morton had white musicians. That strain had never separated until music left the feet. And so I guess my prayer for the future is that we stop looking at music and start dancing to it again. Thank you. So I have a question. I you just all. applauded for myself. I'm so excited. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question about the second half of the title, Beyond the Colon. It's rock and it's role in society, especially the role thing. And you've addressed that a little bit. And if you think about the role of music, it's been used, as Ernie said, to sell, sell toothpaste. It's been used to get people up and dancing. It's been used to get people excited about Monday Night Football before the game. It's been used to protest current political situations. What, what do you see as the role from your perspective, or at Adrian in your case as a musician? What's your role as a musician? Or do you all have a vision for how you'd like to see music used, what its role should be in terms of <coughs> political or emotional or whatever? 
I, I don't think it's changing. I think it's it's the same as it's always been. It's it's nice organized noises to enhance our experience here on Earth. It's really all it is. You you could you could dance without music, right? I mean you could just start moving your feet and dancing. But it's more fun with a good tune. Um, I, I think its role is it's just, it's, just, it's a permeative aspect of life. Um, so you name it. I mean, some people like to do yoga and they listen to yoga appropriate music. It's usually some sort of shakuhachi flute, um, some, some kind of gentle meditative music to complement the, you know. Um, when me and my buddies on a Friday night in high school would go out to party, um, we'd turn on ACDC in my buddy's pickup truck and that would get us riled up to try to pick up some girls. Um, <laughs> You know, I, I, I love listening to Beethoven uh, if I want to feel inspired um, to get into that, that space of, uh, you know, getting, getting beyond my, my mind's chatter and get to that clear space where there's just a consciousness. Um, you know, I kind of look at it as like, you know, this idea that you know, the universe is an ocean. Uh, we're drops of water in the universe. So yes, you've got your distinctness, but when, when, you, when, you, when you look at it, you're, you're a part of it. And, and Ernie touched upon that beautifully. Um, but you know, the more my mind starts to talk and, and, and commentate about reality, I, I feel separate. And one of the great roles for me personally uh, that mu certain music can do is it can remind me about that connectedness again. And for some reason, I can't seem to write music um, or, or play music with any sort of power if, if I'm in that insular space. I need to find that space of connectedness. And I mean, if I put Beethoven's seventh on and listen to the third movement, uh, it gives me that, it gives me that. So I mean, Wow, there's a cool thing music can do. I mean, it can presence me to my true nature. <laughs> um, and you know, the list could go on forever. So music's role, it's, it's you know, I, I, again, I go back to that keynote. It, it made drills on a factory floor seem inspiring. <laughs> I, I could see some people wanting to stand up and put their hands on their chests because the music was so <laughs> sweeping. Um, I'm going to pass it on, yeah. Any other thoughts on that? Yeah, I feel like he like summed it up pretty well. And like I feel, I agree, Like I don't think the purpose of music is totally changing. I think music helps us perceive the world and understand our emotions and express our emotions. And I think music can also be used as an escape from reality at times. Um, but I also think that, you know, I mean, music has so many different elements because at on one level, music's an escape from reality, but we also use music to understand reality. And when we look at you know music that involves political issues or social issues and all those kinds of things. So, I mean, I think music really is the universal language. I think that regardless of your culture or whatever, I think we all have music inside of us and want to express that, um, whether that's you're a musician or you're listening to music, so, yeah. Nice, thank you. Any other comments? Ernie, I can the tell you're about to say something. The question was what we would like to see. As, you're a, as a musician, what, yeah, what do you a, see your as role? Our, as our personal perception, what we would like to see as the purpose of music. Or your own music, what role would you like music? it to play? Yeah. Personally, I would like to see the role of music in, in our life as something that is elevating, as something that is uplifting, 
is something that's inspiring us to reach out and go forward in a positive way. Thank you. James, do you have anything to say? I just want to dance. <laughs> <laughs> so here, it, 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 it's got a good beater. I give it a 98. I like to dance to it. <laughs> so we have a question from the audience here that's an interesting. What is the future in your minds of art music? And then parenthesis, symphony, opera. I guess what, is the, what do you see is, does that have a future, that genre of music? Are those genres? Well, of course. Yeah, it's the it's it's really great stuff to dance to. <laughs> you can get out, man. Some of that Beethoven stuff. It's like when I used to listen to Beethoven as a as a young kid. It was like listening to Count Basie, right? It was there was a groove, definite groove to Beethoven, definite groove to Bach. All of that music has a groove. All of that music has a spirit. All of that music has a, has a, a soul to it. Uh, that's the same information and the same energy that we tune into when we listen to Stravinsky. Da, 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 You know, that's primal. You know, a lot of classical music comes from folk music that is dance oriented music it is just done in that particular manner in that on that particular level so i think there's a place for what you call art music you know uh art music that's a concept right it that's a per, that that's a perceptual thing uh, classical music is art music. Some people call Ar Ornette Coleman art music. You know, some people call uh, a lot of different things art music because they have trouble dancing to it, right? We're going back, we are going back to the dance, right? <laughs> there's always the dance. So uh, I think there's a definite place for all of that music because it <sighs> appeals to various people's perception and concept and what makes them feel better after they listen to it than before they put it on. You know, and that's sort of the purpose. That's the purpose of a concert, that's the purpose of a dance, that's the purpose of all the music that we do, and hopefully everything that we do. You know, hopefully after we have a musical experience or a dance experience, we feel better when we leave the building than when we got there, hopefully, you know, so. Can you, uh, can you ask the question again? Because I had a thought, but I want to make sure I'm addressing it properly. Uh, I don't know, I made it up. Um, <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice, you're improvising, I like it. What is your role as a musician, or what would you like the no, role no. of your music to be? No, no, the one about um, art music. Oh, oh, oh yeah, that one, that's right. There we go. Uh, let me find that one. What, what, what is the future of music, of art music, symphony, opera, etc.? Right. So, I mean, I'm guessing the future of somehow relates to the, the idea of... Um, being out there, being popular, um, bum, bums in seats at, in a concert hall, that, that's what future defines, right? Um, I mean, if I'm practicing it in my basement alone with no one there to hear it, I suppose that means there's no future for it. But, but if, if we can show that people will come out and hear it, that means it has a future, right? Um, you know, one of the discussion, uh, my, my main genre is um, jazz music. Um, I, I, I'm in a, I'm in a jazz band in, in Toronto called, uh, the worst pop band ever. Um, and it's obviously, it's, it's, it's a, you know, it's a intended to be humorous band title, but also a bit of a social commentary about, you know, jazz has always been a fringe music. Um, but the people who love it really love it. Um, but not a lot of people really love it. 
And, you know, these jazz festivals are always trying to come up with creative ways to get more people out. And, you know, it's like trying to sell a kale salad as a Big Mac. It's like, oh, you, oh, you like Big Macs? Well, well, this is kind of like a Big Mac, because you see that green stuff on the, on the Big Mac? Well, this is green. So why don't you try the kale? And, you know, we were talking about, you know, more and more jazz festivals are, are booking pop artists as their headliners, and then they kind of sneak the jazz in there. Because people want to dance. <laughs> right, and it's great that they want to dance. But, you know, the funny thing is, I mean, if someone came up to me and said, I heard, I heard this, I heard this music. It was this Hawaiian musician playing this seashell, and they made these noises, and it was really, it really moved me. It, it, it did something to my soul. I, I, felt, I felt this physiological change, and, and I just loved it. And I, I was, this person's passion might be infectious to me, and I might want to check out this music I've never heard and, and be open to it because this other person kind of passed on their excitement. I think that's the problem. If there's a problem with the future of art music, is that they're trying to sell it to people who don't like art music by saying, hey, come see the symphony. We'll play a few Beatles tunes for you. And I think, I don't know. I mean, I think if there was more just getting in touch with why the guys who are putting on jazz festivals and classical music festivals love that music, um, you know, I didn't ask to like jazz. I mean, I kind of wish that I, <laughs> I, I, I loved pop. Like, I wish I could put my energies towards, maybe I'd be a millionaire by now, but the reality of it is I heard Bud Powell and then Herbie Hancock and then Bill Evans and Charlie Parker and John Coltrane. That stuff lit me up. My, I felt alive, like, you know, I was on my own magic carpet ride when I listened to that music. So that's what grabbed me, and that's where my passion is. Um, so that's why I, I occupy myself with that music. If I can pass that on to somebody, they're more apt to come and check out jazz music than for me to say, hey, we're going to, you know, we're, we're, we're going to do this weird, crazy version of a Beyonce tune, and you'll <laughs> like it because you'll recognize the Beyonce tune. But, you know, I, I think if we sold our passion... Um, everyone can relate to that on some level. So, I mean, the future of art music, if you love it, tell people you love it and try to, conv try to convey to them what it is that it does for you and maybe then they'll open themselves up in themselves to have that same impact. That, that, that's just my thought on that. Yeah, so. Cool. Yeah. We have a, a couple of questions here, one that are related, so I'm going to kind of read them both to you. One was specifically to Allison, but because of the other question, they relate. One is, how are artists, bands protecting their music with streaming, etc., and is music still being copyrighted? And in a related question, somebody said, some folks maintain that the concept of musicians profiting from their recordings is only a brief interruption in the long history of exploration by the music companies. What are your thoughts on that claim and the subject of intellectual property? Have, so with all the technology changes, where is intellectual property, I guess? I have a question. Yes. I'm an old guy, and this question has come to me. Nobody is going to get up and ask a question? I mean, in the last year, it was last year only, and people got up, and they came up, or they stood up, and they asked the question. Now... What the hell is that? <laughs> it's like we're texting each other. Yeah, what the hell is that? And then you guys are sitting out there all passive, right? You know, you know it's like, are we involved? <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> can, uh, can, can we make a rule that... <laughs> If they want to actually ask the question with Find their voices, the can they do it instead of the cue cards? Or? Like, 
Analog questions? Well, they used to have <laughs> analog questions? Analog, really? Yeah, analog <laughs> questions? In real time. <laughs> <laughs> but they have to be sung. <laughs> oh. Shut him up. You <laughs> <laughs> talk very eloquently about the future of music. And I, I just want to know a little bit just about the future of the music industry. What experiences do you have? Because so many really great musicians have taken sort of the bat away from music because of the huge boom of the music industry. So do you have any thoughts about the music industry? I have, a, I have a simple answer, but I think this is, this is your person for the music, yeah. the music business. So um, I've been playing the saxophone for about 57 years. Uh, I, I've been in the music business for 50. Uh, I've played with pop bands, rock bands, jazz bands. Uh, I have done TV shows, films, all of that stuff. So I didn't, I was there, right? I was, I was in the Army. I was third clarinet on Thursday. I was a saxophone solo on a Gino Vanelli record on a Friday. Uh, Monday through Friday, I was a saxophone player on the Tonight Show band with Johnny Carson. I would go and I would play clarinet for Henry Mancini on some military movie. So I'm sort of a soldier. And from being in the middle of all that stuff, you know, I was in the Grammy Orchestra, I was in the Academy Awards Orchestra. I w we used to say, as a studio musician, we used to say, we were the top of the bottom. <laughs> you know, or the, or the bottom of the top, you know. So we were, the, we were the soldiers. Now, from being a soldier, basically what I've seen with the music business is nothing. There's no change. The music business is a business. It's a music business. It's a bunch of folks that are trying to make money so that they can raise their families and send their kids to a nice school and have a good life. And so they've done it through creating a system called the music business. So for us, for the soldiers, we have to decide what we are going to per help perpetuate. You know, I stopped working in LA, I stopped working in the studios because as a soldier, they would call me in to play on a film and I would be playing this beautiful theme on a film and then I'd look at the film, uh, the film clip and somebody was being raped or it was a car wreck or it was a big, uh, or it was a big bank heist. Right? So I couldn't consciously help perpetuate something that I didn't believe in. Okay? That's as a soldier. So I, I picked the things that I wanted to do. Uh, the music business is just a business. It's a bunch of guys trying to make as much money as they can doing something with music. And uh, when, they d when they can't, they do something else. They're always looking, right? And so that's why we have a music business. And so that's why we have so many musicians that are depressed or sad or suicidal or whatever. But I believe that's not the music business's fault. That's our fault. That's the way we perceive ourselves. 
and we allow ourselves to be victims. You choose to be a victim. You know, if you're a victim, it's because there's something there that's fulfilling something else. And so for everybody that's, that doesn't feel successful, for everybody that doesn't feel like they have an outlet, there's an outlet. There's more outlet now than there's ever been. Uh, Patricia and I, we started our own uh, record company 15 years ago. And the reason we started our own record company 15 years ago was because I fired the music business. You know, they weren't good enough. The music business was not good enough for what I had in my heart to give. And it wasn't, and there wasn't a place for me to give what I truly wanted to give. So I had to create my own, uh, you know, my, my, my own environment. And this is a wonderful, incredible time for us to do that. And I think Allison can tell you about that, how people create their own reality. Yeah, I mean, I thought you put that perfectly. And I mean, we're seeing more of that. I mean, it's no secret that the music industry does screw artists over. Um, it's a business. Um, and most people there, they're there for the money when you look at a lot of record execs and all that kind of stuff. And it is unfortunate. I've seen a lot of artists get treated very poorly when I think they should be treated very well. And I think, like he was saying that, I mean, now is the perfect time for artists to take control of kind of their destiny in the music industry. We're seeing more independent artists now make it big than ever because of technology and online. Um, I think that you know there's artists that only have a team of five or six people and they can make a, a living off of that. Um, you know you don't always have to have this record label backing. And in LA, I mean, there's definitely still the push, and I mean you feel the record labels there. Um, but I do think that the more times we use online information and all these kinds of things, I think that people have the ability now more than ever to really shape their career in the way that they want and make a difference in the way they want. Um, and I mean, we're even seeing that with artists of how they spend their money. Um, if they choose to donate some of their money to organizations or whatever they choose to do and they use their platform to speak out against some of the stuff that's going on in the music industry and whether that be with the money or how you know people, managers are treating their artists. Um, there was one pop star a few years ago named Kesha, who has been very outspoken about a lawsuit revolving her manager on a sexual assault case. And, and I think that goes to show that artists have more power now to speak out against the record labels because they're not so dependent on them. Um, and that's how I feel, yeah. And those are choices that we can make. You know, like you were talking about, so many people are getting out of the music business or so many really great artists are trying you know, to do something else because it's so depressing. Uh, we can stand up and we can create what is in our heart. And, you know, for me, it's, it's, it's my philosophy. This is my personal philosophy. If you have something inside you that you have to do, it's the Holy Spirit teaching you. It's the Holy Spirit guiding you. If you believe in a spirit that will give you something that's beautiful and that's a gift and makes you feel good and makes other fe people feel good, then you will also believe in a spirit that will give you some place to manifest that. I did not believe that, I, don't, I, I believe that there is a benevolent energy. I believe in all this energy. I believe in all of, all, all of this vibration. But I also believe that at the bottom of it, at the back of it, it's benevolent. And I believe that if you make a choice and you choose a direction, it's because you're being directed. And when you make a commitment to your direction, miracles happen. Miracles happen in your life. Uh, I'm a living, walking miracle, okay? I should have been dead about five times. So I'm here for a reason. I have made my commitment to that reason. And because of that, I go forward. Now, whatever the music business wants to do, the music business can do. 
whatever Beyonce wants to do, Beyonce can do. I got no problem with Beyonce. But whatever I feel and whatever I feel guided towards, I have a right to do. And there is a place for me in the universe to do what I do. I don't have to be Beyonce. I don't have to make $26 million a year to be okay. You know? What I have to do to be okay is feel like I'm real. To feel like I'm here instead of trying to be here or wanting to be here or wishing I was here and something is holding me back or that guy's doing something to me or that person is keeping me from doing what I can. Nobody can stop you but yourself. And that's what you have to think about. That's what you have to think about if you have friends. You know, you ask the question. So you may have someone that's close to you. So you may have someone that's you. You know, we all have a choice. And if you make a choice and you make a decision and you stand up and you make a commitment, you will be absolutely amazed at things that happen. We get phone calls every day. We get phone calls all day. We're putting together tours. We tour, Patricia and I, and we tour all over the world. And it's one of the craziest damn things you ever saw in your life, dealing with promoters, trying to get gigs, trying to put a tour together, and you've got four musicians that are holding time for you, and you told them that you had this period of time, and it's, and, and it's April, and the gigs start in June, and you've got three gigs, you know? And then, bam, stuff starts to happen. June comes up, you got a full tour. I can't explain it, but I know what I feel. And I think that works for all of us. And I think you should tell your friends that, you know? So uh, that's, that's very important because it comes from here. It's, an, it's the cause. And we get so hung up on the effect that the cause gets totally drowned in trash. You know? You, we, we get we get so lost in this. We get so lost in, well, what am I going to do with this attorney? What am I going to do with this attorney? Oh, man, I got four musicians waiting. Oh, man, the booker didn't call back. The booker hasn't called back. Oh, no, they promised me this much money, and he only wants to give me that much money. They're not going to cover hotel. What the hell am I going to do with four guys with two nights off? I got to pick up all the hotels. So, you know. You can't get lost in there. You just got to know here. I can't explain it to you any other way except we do have help. And you can ask for it. And it's there. All you have to do is let it in. So that's another, uh, that, that's another panel. <laughs> <laughs> we have another question here which, um, well, I'll, I'll, I'll read out and it, <laughs> it assumes an interesting premise which you might not agree with. Why do so many people abandon music as we get older? Anybody want to? I don't think, um, well, I think everybody keeps listening to music if they've ever liked it when they get older. Um, it gets, getting gigs gets rougher when you're older unless you're at least at the top of the bottom. <laughs> <laughs> bottom of uh, the top. <laughs> but, um, and and um, I know a lot of musicians have stopped playing because DJs came in, cheaper for the club owners. And so some cities like New Orleans and Austin, you know, have campaigns through the Tourist Bureau, go hear live music, go hear live music. But nobody used to have to be encouraged to go hear live music because a band is a lot more fun to dance to than a record player. Um, and so some people give up music just because of the changing, you know, technocracy of lights and turntables rather than live musicians, which means they're out of work. And so they stop. But there was a time in New Orleans, you know, all the great jazz musicians, uh, King Oliver and all the members of Creole Jazz Band, Louis Armstrong on second trumpet, 
and um, George Louis O'Mare and uh, the, the Beche brothers, one of them was a dentist. Everybody had day jobs, but there were night gigs to go to. And I think what's happened now is there just aren't those night gigs um, to go to. Any other thoughts? I saw, Allison, let's go back to the, this one question for you that I'm not sure we answered. How are artists and bands protecting their music with streaming and everything? Is music still being copyrighted? How are Yeah, like, well, music's still being copyrighted. I still copyright my music, but I do know, like, um, because of online, um, there's a kind of a law that if you're publishing your music online and you don't have it copyrighted, there's still a amount of it that if it was to be stolen, um, you can like argue that it's still part of yours. Um, I really don't know a lot about that just because I've just copyrighted all the music I've ever worked on just to be safe. Um, but yeah, I mean, well, this is kind of going off topic, but I mean, streaming is interesting because it, I mean, musicians are getting put like kind of pigeonholed when it comes to the streaming services because like Spotify, for example, I think it's some ridiculous thing. They pay you like, point zero 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 nine cents for every stream that you get so i mean even if you're taylor swift who's having millions of streams every day you're really not making much profit in regards to the ratio of how many streams you're getting so i mean it's just this kind of like double-edged sword of you have to put your music on streaming services because that's where kids my age are listening to music yet you're not getting paid anything um and like kids my age unfortunately like you don't go to the store to buy CDs anymore because half the, like, I don't even know a store that you can go buy a CD in. Like, I think Target's, like, the last place that, ha and it's a super small section, and it's only, like, the pop artists whose CDs are there. So, I mean, if you're trying to find new music, you use services like Spotify and Pandora, um, you know, for people who are interested in curating, like, a larger library of musicians and music they listen to, but... I mean, that's not totally related, but I do think that, you know, streaming services have kind of changed the way we even look at, you know, how are we creating the music and how are we copywriting it and how are, are we protecting the art, I'd say, and, like, the value of the art. So didn't really answer the question, but. Great. We protect our music as much as we can. And then after that, for our own sanity, we just have to relate to everything else as promotion. And if somebody sees you on something that is stolen or you didn't get paid for, there's more of a possibility that they're going to say, yeah, those guys are great. I want them to do a concert at this place or whatever. So that's what it's sort of boiled down to. A lot of it is, a lot of it is promotion. And it's, as we say, out of sight, out of mind. So if people see you and people hear you in any particular sort of fashion, there is more of a possibility that something develops out of that than if they don't. And that way you don't get depressed or get dangerous, you know. Adrian, did you, were you gonna say something? Uh, what, one of my all-time favorite artists is a pianist named Keith Jarrett. Uh, he's, um, all of his music since about 1983 has been released on a, on a German label called ECM. And they're very famously protective of keeping their music off of streaming sites. Um, so when I hear about a new Keith Jarrett record, um, I've got to buy it. And I do, because <laughs> I like his music. And, um, you know, I'm kind of wondering, like, maybe maybe this whole streaming world thing is it's fairly new still, right? So maybe in, you know, maybe in the ocean of streamable music, eventually the guy you can't stream is going to be the one who stands out. I don't know. Um, yeah, and we're seeing that. I mean, because Adele's last album, uh, she refused to put it on streaming services. And, I mean, that album broke records as far as physical copies sold, especially for, like, my age group of 
and yeah, I think that's, I think it will become a thing, but it's definitely going to have to start with some of these bigger artists. Um, I think like a mid tier artist, if they decided, well, no, I'm only going to sell physical copies for someone my age, you probably wouldn't make it to the store. But you know, Adele, there was a lot of hype around her album, especially for people my age. And so, I mean, my friends, like we all got in the car and like we went to the store and we bought the, the album and it is a special experience. And I do think that not everything will be streaming. I think there's a, a good group of people that are my generation who do love music and who do value it. And I think, I mean, physical copies still will be sold. And I have CDs in my car. I listen to CDs more than I listen to my phone. But, um, yeah. And, and there's, like, there's a distinction, too, between purchasing a digital copy and streaming it. I mean, uh, you know, I have an Apple Music subscription, and there are a lot of albums in the iTunes store that you can't stream with an Apple Music subscription, right? So that's another distinction. I mean, um, I kind of like that there's a bit of a trend with vinyl again. Um, where I live, uh, just outside of Toronto, one of the biggest vinyl pressing plants in all of the world, I think, in Burlington, Ontario, just opened. And they've got like a two-year back backlog for for orders so that's that's kind of exciting to me it's, it kind of makes me think a bit about sort of the those those ebook readers mm -hmm. like the kobos and the kindles and and when they first came out there was a real sort of threat to the to the paper book industry but what they've actually found is um analog books are still thriving people have actually gone no you know what I like the smell of paper, and I like the bookmark, and I like the feel of having this physical tactile thing in my hands, and they've actually, you know, books are winning <laughs> in the technological revolution, so I don't know. I mean, it would be interesting to see what might happen when we're exposed to this new sort of format long enough. Maybe people will say, no, I don't, I don't like having unlimited access to everything. I, I miss sitting there and reading liner notes and and the physical ritual of putting a record on a turntable or putting a CD or even putting a cassette or remember eight tracks, you know, like just there, there's a ritualism to it. Maybe, you know, just like smokers, you know, they, they like to pull their cigarette out of the pack and light it and smoke it. They, they don't want to chew a piece of gum that gives them nicotine or use an, a lot of them don't want to use those vaporizer e-cigarettes, even though they're more convenient and better for you. They like the ritual. We're ritual ritualistic animals so <laughs> fingers crossed you we, know we've got 30 uh, three minutes left I got one last question here for each of you that that, that that have here so if you could each take 30 seconds to answer it would be perfect what genre of music vibrates best for you you want James James you want to start down there down New Orleans New Orleans rhythm and blues and brass band jazz which draws a lot of people because it's dance music uh, jazz, acoustic jazz, uh, the music of Miles Davis, Thelonious Monk, John Coltrane, and uh, people like that. Cool. Um, I grew up with my grandparents, so I'm actually going to probably give an answer you guys don't think. Um, <laughs> Motown music. Really like Motown. The Temptations, Stevie Wonder, stuff like that. All right. Yeah, jazz music uh, is largely improvised music that's created in the moment, uh, where there's that 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 tension of of trying to explore something in the here and now. So that's that's what vibrates best for me. Terrific. Let's uh, show our appreciation for this panel. Thank you all for being here this morning, and that's it for this panel.